So welcome everyone uh, to our next lecture here in the Reinforcement Learning Control uh, task. Um, so today we're going to discuss Markov decision processes and different variants of it leading through towards the Markov decision process. I guess we will require for this a little bit more than 90 minutes, so I already excused for this uh, beforehand. Uh, after the lecture today, we're going to have a short break. And after that, we will have an exercise by Wilhelm <laughs> on the fundamentals of using Python for scientific programming, where every one of you is highly encouraged to participate if he or she has not already at least intermediate skills in using Python for scientific computing. If you feel very comfortable with uh, using Python as a programming language for scientific computing, uh, I think you do not need to attend the exercise, but we offer it as a basic uh, introduction course to Python for those which uh, are new to the programming language. Okay, but today Markov decision processes, and for this we're going to introduce a little preface. Um, we will see that Markov decision processes are basically uh, mathematical idealized problems of reinforcement learning uh, yeah, situations. And we will see throughout also some examples, especially during the exercises, but also partly during the lectures, that many real-world examples, so problems we see, can be somehow extracted as Markov decision processes. Also, we can see that Markov decision processes as such can have different varieties. One variety is, are we able to observe the entire states? So we have discussed that already last week. Do we have a fully observable or so-called partially observable problem where some states which are important to um, describe the underlying dynamics, the underlying information which we need to describe the system, are these fully available or not? And another thing which we also discussed is the problem space of the MDP. Basically the question is that an MDP which has finite number of states and actions or is there either the states and or the action space, a continuous state space and action space, which would make the problem space infinitely large. However, in the next five to six lectures, we are first going to discuss the simple case where we consider a fully observable MDP. So all the inputs which we have at hand are identical to the states of the system. So we have full state knowledge. And also we will focus on finite MDPs where we are able to describe the entire state and action space by a finite set of numbers. Uh, we can also differentiate the different Markov models in this sense of observability and finite or infinite uh, spaces. And in particular, we will see that all states are observable, yes or no can lead to the Markov chain, which we will introduce today formally, and the Markov decision process, which has actions in contrast to the Markov chain. And if the states are unobservable or partially observable, we have a hidden Markov model and a partially observable MDP, which we are not going to discuss today. And only the partial observable MDP will be handled as a small outlook during the very last lecture of the entire course. So therefore, we will really focus on a derivation towards the Markov decision process for finite states and actions. In a finite state and action space, the question also arises, how do we represent information? And for this, I've brought a little example like this chessboard. And of course, if we have any chess item which can be placed on this chessboard, we could describe its location and therefore its state on the field in different variants. One opportunity could be that we define some kind of vectorial information where we have the horizontal and the vertical information. So the vertical and horizontal information of this chess piece, this was, would be a first opportunity. Or a second opportunity would be that we just use some kind of scalar function or a scalar uh, identifier, which basically tells us that this is the first field, this is the second field, third field, fourth, and so on, until eight, and then nine, 10, 11, and so on. 
And of course, if we enumerate the field numbers in this way, these two representations are exactly identical. And we are going to focus on the latter one, on the scalar representation, because it's simpler, we do not need to care about vectors, and we can therefore represent in a finite Markov problem any state or action by a scalar kind of index or a scalar kind of information value. So therefore, uh, in the reminder of today's lecture and also until the next five or six lectures, you will see that any state, as you denoted as x, or also action denoted as u, will be a non-bold quantity, basically indicating that is a scalar information, because in a finite space, we can basically just number all states, we can number all actions, and represent this information accordingly. Later on, when we're going to uh, develop further towards continuous state in action spaces, you will also see that some uh, times we need to go back to the vectorial notation because then we need to put more information mm -hmm. into uh, these numbers. Okay, so this has been like a little preface in terms of notation and in terms of what we're going to focus during the lecture. And for today, I've basically brought you four subsections. Um, basically, with every subject, subsection, we will add a little bit to our problem description, to our problem scope. We're going to start with Markov change, which are basically autonomous stochastic processes without any opportunity to us to manipulate them. Then Markov reward processes, where we will also describe some degree of usefulness or some degree of optimality by rewards. Then finite Markov decision processes, this will be basically the, the final problem description which we're going to discuss today, where we also have the opportunity of actions. And then based on the Markov decision processes, we will discuss again optimal policies and value functions. But let's start with the finite Markov chain. So what is a finite Markov chain? A finite Markov chain is pretty easy. The finite Markov chain is basically comprised of two tuple or a tuple with two items, a state space and a transition probability P. This curly X is here basically our state space. So this is describing how many finite states do I have in my state space. That could be, for example, our chess board game, which we have seen in one of the previous slides. So all the different locations on the chess board could be our state space, for example. If you have, um, I don't know, some car driving example on a discretized grid with discretized location, your position with the car on this discretized grid would be also the state space on which your car is located on one of these state grids points. What is the state transition probability matrix, this curly P? So this is describing the probability starting in some state X at the time step K, transiting to the next state X dash at the next time step K plus one. So this will basically indicate if in our model, our chess piece is somewhere here, how big is the probability that this chess piece will be located like in this direction, on this direction, on this direction. So it basically just tells us if we are currently here, what is the probability to go this, this, and there? Okay, so it's basically just indicating us the dynamics of the system which we are operating with. So therefore, a Markov chain is a specific stochastic process model, process model in that sense that we work here with probabilities. Therefore, the states are random variables and also the Markov chain in this notation works with information states, so that means the representation of these dynamics is basically memoryless, so the dynamics are time independent. So this probability of transitioning between two states is independent from time, and therefore it is independent from when we do this transition, it is always with the same probability. In continuous time framework, which we do not operate here because we are operating in this discrete time frame, this would be called a Markov process. However, this would be somehow a little bit, you know, um, 
inconsistent with the Markov decision process. So this is basically just a formal hint here. If you go through the literature on uh, stochastic processes and you find an information on Markov process, that could be also the continuous time framework of a Markov chain, which is implemented in discrete time. Okay, so therefore, if we look on the Markov chain, basically two information pieces are need to be defined here. The one is the state space. This is, of course, it's a problem depending, system depending. And the other thing which we should look a little bit deeper into is the state transition probability. So the probability to transit from one to the other state. So this is defined here again. So giving some mark of state and its successor, the state transition probability for every combination x, x dash out of the state space is defined in the finite case by a matrix. So for example here, where we have n states. Therefore, this state transition probability as our state space is finite can be always represented by a matrix with limited dimension, right? So if we have n states, a finite number of states, every element of this state transition probability matrix will indicate how large is the probability to transit from one state into the other. So P11 would be the probability if I am in state number one, whatever state number one is in our identity with respect to the problem, how big is our probability to stay within the same state after the next time step? P12 would be then the probability if I'm in state number one. How big is the probability that I will change towards state number two and so on? So therefore, all the transitions which are possible within the state space between every one to the nth state can be represented by this state transition probability matrix. And of course, this matrix can be only formed due to the limitations of a finite state space. Right? If we would have continuous states, so infinitely many states, because the states are defined on the real numbers, then of course I could not really define such a matrix because there would be infinitely many state transition probabilities. Then I need to work with continuous distributions and not with such a discrete distribution. For obvious reasons, also if I sum up the elements of every uh, row here, of course, the sum of the probabilities must be one because this is indica indicating then if I'm in state one, 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 how big is the probability to transit towards any other state? And of course, if I sum up these probabilities, that must be one because there will be some state transition probability, maybe even the probability to stay within the state, but at the end, it will be always a one if I add up all the elements of a row. Okay, the state transition probability matrix will be very important also later on to describe the value and state action value functions because it will basically describe the model in that sense of the dynamics, how we change the states in between the different time steps completely, right? So this is a very important part of our model, describing how the underlying system which we operate with is working. Let's have a very little example on a Markov chain, uh, and we will utilize this example, which I have called here a forest tree example throughout the entire lecture in different notions. In the Markov chain notion, we will just need to define states, right? The states and the state space. That was the first information describing the Markov chain. And the second information was the state transition probability. In this very simple example, I'm defining four states, x1, 2, 3, and 4. And every of the states with this number 1 to 4 is indicating basically a uh, state of a forest, which could be a small forest with small trees, a medium-large forest with medium-large trees, a very large forest, and there is a certain disaster probability, which I have defined here as disaster probability alpha, 
So there might be some uh, storm or something like that, that this entire forest or the trees inside the forest are basically cut it down, are destroyed, and the forest and its trees would be gone. So therefore, in our little example, which is basically completely made up, we have a probability of alpha from the first state, when the forest is still small, that there might be some storm or natural hazard, which will basically cut down all trees with probability alpha. That would be this alpha here in our state transition probability. We are in the first state, which is here this row, and our transition probability to go into the last state, state number four, where the entire forest is cut down by a hazard, is alpha. And with probability one minus alpha, over time, within the next time step, whatever the next time step is, could be like in five years or 10 years or whatsoever, the forest will have grown a little bit until it's a medium sized. And this is in here, this element of our state transition probability one minus alpha going from state x1 to x2, right? Same then, of course, also here for the second row, that would be the probability to go from state two to the gone state or state number three, where the forest has grown even a little more. So this would be the disaster, and this would be the yeah, growth path, and so on. And also here, as a, let's say, specialty of the last state, state number three, we also assume that with state probability one minus alpha, the state is not changing, so there would be some natural growth limitations where the forest will not grow any further. And this would be then basically also here, this element one minus alpha, which is P33. So we stay within state number three with probability one minus alpha. The gone state here would be a so-called final state or terminal state, because we can see here that the last state, which is basically indicated here by the last row, has only a one at its element P44, basically indicating if I'm in state number four, I will not leave state number four any time in the future. That would be a terminal state or final state. So therefore, with basically this information, this graphical information representing my state space, so my nomenclature between state indices 1, 2, 3, 4, and their meaning in the context of our problem, and the definition of the state probabilities, we would have a full definition, a complete definition of our Markov chain, right? So this would be a complete example of a Markov chain. We have the state space, and we have the state transition probabilities here. With this model, because this is a stochastic model, right? So there are certain likelihoods that certain outcomes will result, natural hazard or growth. Uh, we can also draw so-called samples. Samples will become very important starting from in two weeks, uh, where we're going to utilize data-driven methods in order to solve MDP problems. But samples can be already uh, demonstrated or shown here in an exemplary fashion for this Markov chain, uh, which basically means that we just basically do something like starting our random state generator and random state transition generator that we say, okay, if this is our starting state, I want to just randomly draw exemplary trajectories through the state space with these probabilities one minus alpha and alpha. So one, Sample trajectory could be, for example, starting in the small tree space and then directly go to state number four, where the forest is cut it down, or from small to medium to go on, and so on, right? So these trajectories here would be samples through the state space, which represent potential outcomes out of this stochastic process, right? And of course, if I would draw more samples from this stochastic process, it could be also the case that some samples basically repeat, right? So these 
four samples which we have put here on the uh, white uh, board, they are basically, of course, all different. But if I would draw more samples and more samples, we would, of course, see that some of the samples would also reoccur in that sense that maybe this direct transition from small to gone will repeat itself throughout a number of samples which we draw from our Markov chain. Okay? Therefore, samples are very important. Exemplary trajectories drawn from the random Markov chain indicating possible trajectories through the state space of the problem. Okay, so that is already everything which we need to know regarding finite Markov chains. They're just representing our problem and that sense of our internal dynamics. So what is our problem, state space, and how can we move through the state space that would be the state transition probability? These are also autonomous processes in that sense that if I go back to my little example here, that we as engineers do not have any opportunity to manipulate this, right? So this is a process which will just, you know, run for itself and we do not have any actions or anything which we can manipulate here in this system. So it's a completely closed system, an autonomous system, where we can, of course, look from the outside, like what is happening, observe also samples, trajectories from the system, but we have no opportunity to interact with it. Okay, therefore we would call that an autonomous process. Also, at this point, we do not have any indication of how do we evaluate or how do we um, yeah, evaluate if certain states or state transitions are better or worse than others, right? So here we do not have any rewards indicating that we like small trees or large trees or no trees. Um, we just have the dynamics, right, of the system. So there is no degree of optimality which we can bring into the evaluation of the system. Really just a simple dynamical problem. Any questions so far to the Markov chains? Yes. Okay, so what is the difference between staying in a state and staying in the final state, right? Yes. So maybe let's go to this slide. So the difference here is that uh, in the state number three, for example, which we have referred to partially, that in this state we have two transitions which could be possible. The one could be that we stay within the same state, right? And the other one could be that we leave the state towards the state. So there are still two outcomes possible, staying in the state and leaving the state. This would be a true final terminal state because once you are in the state X4, there is no other outcome for the next successor state, except to stay in the state, same state, right? So here you will stay maybe, I don't know, five, 10 or whatsoever steps potentially in state number three, depending on how we choose alpha and how randomness involves. But at some point, if alpha is not zero, but greater than zero, at some point you will follow up the state transition from X3 to X4. And the difference here in X4 is that you will stay in X4 forever, really forever. Is that answering your question? Very good question. So uh, is there any um, terminal state in every Markov decision? problem or Markov problem, we are not yet here with the decision process, uh, the answer is no, it depends. So in this example, which I've made up here for just cartoonic kind of uh, problem, uh, we have a terminal state, but there doesn't have to be a terminal state. There can be also processes which basically just go forever and forever and forever. Um, so consider, for example, some, I don't know, like a finite, um, state space of some kind of a um, stock uh, 
problem of stock shares at the stock market, right? Like the stock market at, at such does not have a, like a terminal final state, right? The stock market will basically continue, continue, continue um, until infinity, and therefore it would not have something like a yeah, final state in which it will transit to. Here in this example, we have just designed one, but we could also argue, for example, that um, let's say the hazard would be not such dramatic that the entire forest will be completely gone, but maybe that the hazard just cuts down us from large to medium or to a small size tree, and therefore erasing this forced state, reducing the state space to three. Right? That would be another example, another problem, but it would not have a terminal state. Okay, so good question. We do not have always a terminal state in this example. We have one, but not always. Other questions? Yes. Multiple final states where we do not come out anymore. Yes, true, why not? Could be the case. So depending on the problem, why not? Definitely, that would be possible. Um, so where we could have maybe an example of multiple final state, which is somehow realistic. Does somebody has one? <laughs> yes, okay, we will see this in the exercise <laughs> later on, yeah, but so there could be definitely problems with multiple finite states. Uh, so for example, consider like some, some game, like a very cartoonish games where um, you can, I don't know, steer some, some, some hero or something like that and this guy can fall into some trap and dies, right? There could be one trap which will make it a final state, but there could be also two, three, or four traps where if the hero jumps into the trap, he dies in the game and game over, right? So in this case, we would have multiple final states. Okay, cool. So finite Markov chains, problem definition with respect to internal dynamics. And now we're going to add just a little bit more in the context of finite uh, reward processes or finite Markov reward processes, which is basically adding to what we already have, the internal dynamics and the state space representation, our reward functions, which we have already briefly introduced last week. So therefore, we now get some metric which is indicating how good or how bad it is to be in a certain state or to do a certain state transition probability, which is our reward function. Right? So the reward function again tells us if we are in a certain state, what reward or reward probability, as this is an expectation, we will get in this state. Okay? So therefore, we can give certain credit, certain metric of usefulness of uh, evaluation to any state. And we will already add a discount factor, gamma, which is between one and zero, basically indicating for a specific problem, how much do we value the rewards of the long-term future, right? So if gamma is close to one, or even exactly one, we would say, okay, we are very interested also in the rewards in the long-term future, or if we say gamma is close to zero, or maybe even identical zero, then this would mean that we are not interested into any long-term rewards. We are very short-sighted. We want to ensure that our short-term rewards are maximum and whatever comes after that, we do okay. So Markov chain extended with rewards. It's still an autonomic process. So we do not have any actions here. It's just the dynamics of the system together with some, yeah, reward indicating how much we like a certain state or not. And the reward at a certain time point only depends on the state, as we, for obvious reasons, do not have any actions. So, given the Markov reward process, what we can now do in our little example with the forest trees, we can just extend it a little bit by adding rewards to the problem or to the model. So therefore, 
In this example, the numbers here are more or less completely random and made up. We say, okay, in state number one, if we have a small tree, we indicate this as a reward equal one. If we have medium-sized trees, we say, okay, reward is two. And if we have large-sized tree, this would be three. And if there are no trees, that would be a reward of, reward of zero, basically indicating the larger the forest is, the more appreciated the forest would be from, I don't know, hikers or what wood production facilities, because from a larger wood, if they, from a larger forest, they can produce more wood if they are interested in it. And if we would lose the entire forest or all trees of the forest, of course, the reward of this would be zero because we cannot utilize the forest for recreational usage or wood production anymore. That we indicate this as reward being one, two, three, and zero, of course, is just exemplary, right? So these numbers could be also others depending on our problem or on personal evaluation. So maybe you do not like trees, so in this case, that would be maybe zero, one, two, three, right? So maybe you like a very flat surface out of a little bit of concrete or something like that, then of course this entire reward ordering, reward indication could be flipped. Also that these are integer numbers is just, you know, example values. You could also make this 1.1, 2.1, 3.1, so just, you know, some example values. The important thing is just that we have extended our model by rewards as such, indicating that every state now basically has a metric indicating how much we like to be in this state within our given problem. With this rewards, we can then also calculate the returns. So the returns we have already introduced last week, but just to give a little recap, what had been those returns? The returns are basically just the series out of rewards. If we have some kind of a finite series for a basically episodic um, Markov reward process, this will be a series of a finite summation. If we have a continuing task, basically meaning that we would not have any terminal state, right? So if we do not have any terminal state, the problem would basically run forever, which would be the continuing task. Then we would basically sum up the rewards in a discounted fashion infinitely long in order to represent the so-called return, right? And from here, from the return definition, with this gamma to the power of i, we already see this idea again of the discounting, discounting uh, very um, close to zero would mean that if we have 0.1 to the power of something, these values would get smaller and smaller and smaller, indicating that we are not interested so much in the long-term returns. And if gamma would be very close to one, this number, of course, even if we multiply it with i being 100 or something like that would be still significant, indicating that we like the returns very much also with respect to the long-term future. And with this formal representation of the returns, what we can then do is, also for the Markov reward process, we can indicate the state value function, which we already introduced last week. The state value function, therefore, is just the expectation of the returns giving a certain state and the state dynamics of the system which we're indicating with, right? And the return or the state value function as such is of course a deterministic uh, value because it's here taking over the expectation and it basically just represents the long-term value of being in a certain state X, which could be here represented in this golf example that for obvious reasons, as the closer you come to the green field, the putting area, the higher the value would be because we indicate that, of course, if you're able to put in uh, the golf ball in the next hit into the greenish area, that this would become better and better. Okay. With these state values and the return definition, we can now also sample some of these state values from our forest. Uh, problem. So, for example, 
Now let's go through different random exemplary samples. The first sample would be again a very short trajectory. So we start here and we directly have bad luck. This alpha probability uh, turns to be true and therefore we transit into the gone state. So our trajectory would only consist out of one state transition. In this case, our estimated, so v hat, hat for estimation based on the sample, value of the starting state would be 1 because we just get the error being 1 for starting in this state and then we do not proceed with any further rewards from there on. Therefore, our estimated sample value for the starting state would be just 1. However, this is just an example ex uh, sample. We can sample again. In this case, we have been a little bit more lucky. So we reach a medium-sized tree, and then we have been unlucky, transitioning towards a gone state. And the sample value would be here the one for starting in the small state. And then we get the reward of two for transitioning towards the second state, but in our example here, we work with a discount factor of 0.5. So we need to multiply this reward of 2, which we get for the second state with 0.2, ending up again, or ending up not again, but together, in a sample value of 2 for this initial state. We can just do again. In this case, we have been even more lucky. So we even make it to the third state and then to the gone state. So we get a, a reward of 2 again, which is discounted by, with 0.5. Then we get another reward of 3 for the large state, which is discounted with gamma to the power of 2, which is 0.25. And therefore, our sample value is here again uh, 3.75. And we can draw many, many more samples. For example, here we stay two times within the large uh, tree size where we can even see that the sample value is even higher. From this samples, of course, the question arises: how can I calculate the expected value, not the sampled value, the estimated sample value, but the expected value of every state accurately and precisely without the need of going through all these samples and basically average them afterwards. And the uh, answer for this, so how to calculate all state values in closed form and exactly, is the so-called Bellman equation. The Bellman equation uh, is basically something which you already know because all the ingredients of the Bellman equation we have already introduced, we just need to rewrite them. Starting point of the Bellman equation is just the definition of the state value. So the state value being the expectation of the returns. The returns uh, we have defined as a series of discounted rewards. And here, I can basically uh, put one gamma in front of this parenthesis. And if you have a look at this series with air k plus 1 being the first element of the series, this again, just the elements of the series in the parenthesis, would be the return g, not starting at time step k, but one time step further at k plus 1. Right? So I can basically rewrite this, and instead of this manual series extension, I just write gk plus 1, so the return of the next successor state, which is discounted here. And of course, this is now a very nice, somehow recursive and compact equation, which basically tells us that the state value is depending on itself being the expectation of the sum of the instantaneous reward plus the discounted value of the successor state. Right? So value of our current state is the expectation 
of the instantaneous reward, so the reward which is directly associated with the state, plus the expectation of the discounted values of all possible successor states. So for this Bellman equation, we can also represent a visual representation, a visual idea of this Bellman equation, which is the so-called backup diagram. How can we read this backup diagram? So here at this uh, topmost node of the Bellman diagram, we would have our starting state, xk, which is associated with the value. And the value of this starting state, xk, would be the expectation, so all possible transitions into all other states associated with the instantaneous reward plus the discounted value of all successor states which we can transit to. So here in this graphical representation, it would be just two states which we can transit to, but of course in a finite Markov problem that could be infinite, not infinitely many, but finitely many states, much more than two, and we would need to add them up in this expectation equation in order to get our state value. Okay, Bellman equation, very important. We will see the Bellman equation also later on in two or three other variants. And the Bellman equation will be very important to calculate many um, metrics of Markov decision processes and reinforcement learning based solutions later on. However, we can also write this Bellman equation a little bit differently, especially in a form which helps us for finite problem spaces in order to calculate the state values in closed form. So therefore, what we do is, we will basically rewrite everything into some kind of um, vectorial notion. So therefore, we define a reward function, R, for every state. So this vector here, which we define Rx, would be the rewards associated with every state. And, of course, these rewards or reward functions, they would to be assumed to be known quantities, right? So as this in our tree example, we know the rewards associated with every, state, uh, with every state. Then we can define our state values, also here in vectorial kind of equation. So Vx are the unknown, so far, unknown state values associated with every state. And now, what we can do is, we can just rewrite our Bellman equation from the previous slide in a vectorial kind of fashion. So, first have a view at this equation here. So, state value is equal to reward plus discounted state values of all successor states, right? So, this is a transition probability going from x to x dash, which is multiplied here with the state value. So this is basically, this multiplication, p times v, will give us the state values of all successor states, right? So therefore, this equation here is the Bellman equation from the previous slide, just in vectorial representation, where here the reward functions carry the randomness of the rewards, mm -hmm. And here the state tr transition probability carries the randomness of the state transitions. Therefore, we do not have any expectation over this equation. And what we get from this is a very nice linear equation, right? So here we have all the state values. Here we have the rewards, discount factor, probability matrix, and again, the state values. And in the context of the Markov problem, which we made up here, we can say, okay, we know the rewards associated with every state. We know gamma, the discount factor. We know the state transition probabilities. And the only thing which we do not know are the state values, which are this vector and this vector. However, we can just rearrange this equation, right? 
So this Vx times gamma Px x dash, you can bring this on the other side and put this into parentheses. And what we get is basically a very nice normal equation with a known matrix A. So this is the identity matrix, which we get from rearranging this equation, minus gamma transition probability matrix x. So x in this in the sense of an unknown quantity, the state value vector, and b, a known right-hand side of this normal equation, right? So known matrix A, known matrix B, uh, sorry, known vector B, and unknown vector X, right? Linear equation system, n unknowns. These are our n unknowns, but n known equations. So this is a perfectly defined linear equation system, and we can solve this linear equation system either by direct inversion, so we could calculate A inverse and bring it on the other side, or we can use numerical calculation methods like matrix decomposition or iterative solutions like subspace methods in order to bring A on the other side and basically solve for X. So therefore, we can basically find that in this Markov reward process, giving knowledge about our model, so giving knowledge about gamma, pre, and error, that we can calculate the state values directly in closed form by just solving this equation. And this would relate to just calculating basically the inverse of A. Right? If you know the inverse of A, you bring A inverse on the other side of the equation, multiply it with B, and you have your solution. And this closed form calculation, of course, in this very simple form is just possible because we have a finite problem space where we can represent everything by vectors and matrices. If you do so for our forest tree problem, just assuming a discount factor of 0.8 and a disaster probability rate of 0.2, we can basically just parameterize our P matrix and our R vector. The R vector would be this 1, 2, 3, and 0 vector. Here the alphas, 0 0.8, 0 0.2. And then you basically solve for V, and what you would get is that the state value of the first state would be 5.7, medium state would be 7.3, large state would be 8.3, and for obvious reasons, because this is a terminal state in our example, the gone state would not have any value. So in this example, we therefore would give the highest value to the large state. So if by chance we would have made it to the large state, because there is this probability of 0.8 to stay within this large tree state, and we have a also quite high discount rate, this state would be appreciated the most in our problem. Of course, these values, the state values, would then change depending also on these parameters, right? So, for example, if I make gamma much smaller, then, of course, also the state value up here would decrease because staying in this state would, of course, give us some future reward in the future, but we would appreciate long-term rewards less significantly than with 0.8. Okay, so the specific numbers which we see here are depending especially on these two parameters. Okay, so that's already everything which we need to introduce regarding reward processes. Reward processes are basically therefore just the indication on how much we like certain states. And we have seen here with the Bellman equation in its vectorial form that we can calculate um, the unknown state value giving knowledge about the model in closed form by just solving this normal equation. Any questions so far to that? Seems to be okay. Good. Then 
we extend our problem space even more. And this will be the last step of extension for the problem space for the entire course, more or less. Um, so finite Markov decision processes. What we do here is basically we build again on top of the Markov reward processes, which we have introduced just recently. And the main element which is now introduced to the finite Markov decision process or short MDP are of course now our actions U and the action space which we introduce here with this curly U. So this is now the first problem definition which is non-autonomous and where we as an engineer or later on our reinforcement learning algorithms basically have an entry point in order to manipulate, to interact with the system. And this would be this actions U, which will basically give us some degrees of opportunity, some degrees of flexibility to make decisions. As we now have actions, we also need to consider two more things. The first thing is that our state transition probabilities, of course, will now also depend on our actions, right? So um, if you know, um, decide to run against the wall, there might be some probability that this will hit you and you will have some pain. If you decide to not walk against this wall, then the probability of experiencing pain will be, of course, much less. So the state transition probability to pain or not pain will depend on your decision. Also, the rewards might depend on the actions itself in that sense that you might also have some, let's say, costs in the lar largest interpretation to make a certain decision. So for example, um, if you are like a stockbroker and you need to invest into some stock shares, then the very instant you need to put, of course, some money on the table, and in the very instant, this would be, of course, not a reward, but basically a negative reward because you give away some of your money. This can then, of course, lead to interests in the long term, and maybe you can get back your investment with some uh, additional interest rate in the future. But in the very first element, in the very first time step where you make this decision to buy something with an investment, this would be, of course, some cost and therefore indicating a negative reward. Okay, therefore, our state transition probability and our reward function may be, they don't must, but may be they become uh, action dependent. Okay, therefore, what is it? A mark of reward processes extended with action and decisions and also rewards and state transitions depend on these actions. If we apply this to our little example, um, we need to extend our example. And to make it simple and not to overcomplicate it, we just add two actions, right? So we have now an action space, curly U, and our action space will consist out of two actions. The first action which we have is the so-called action W, which we call the action weight, and uh, action C, which is cut, for cutting down the trees. Uh, so therefore, this U equals W would mean, okay, we wait and we do not actively nothing to the forest, basically hoping that the forest is growing, or we choose the cutting decision, which we basically chop down all trees and give them to wood production companies or whatsoever, and get something in that for return. And therefore, if we have just a look on our small state, starting state, uh, for example, in this example, we indicate that waiting would give us no reward because we cannot do something with the forest yet. And if we cut down the forest in the small state, we would get a small reward for giving the wood towards a wood production company. If we decide to cut down the trees, we will have a probability basically of one that we end up in the terminal state gone because our entire forest is basically not existing anymore. And if we decide to wait, 
we will have probability 1 minus alpha that we have been lucky so that the forest will grow. And we will have probability alpha that our weighting will result in a disaster which will come in in the intermediate time, a storm or something, and will result in the same outcome that there is no forest anymore. And with these two actions, we can basically proceed. So in the medium stage, we also have two actions. We either cut down everything, then we get an increased reward already of two because we can export or prevent more wood to this wood processing company. Waiting again would be no reward. We have then these two probabilities. Either we get a disaster or we are lucky. And then in this large three um, state, we again have two uh, actions, either to cut it down here with an extended reward because we can produce more wood, or in this large state, if we wait, we assume that we even get a small reward of one, which we could motivate by that every year a little bit out of this very large forest can be put into wood production and maybe you can, I don't know, open the forest for public and get some income money for, from hikers or whatsoever. So therefore, we have extended our Markov problem towards a Markov decision problem because in any of these non-terminal states, we have now two decisions. And we see that both our state transition probabilities as well as our rewards, which we get from our decisions, are now depending on our actions. And what we can do is we can also represent the dynamics of what we have seen graphically on the previous slide again in this vectorial matrix form. Here on the left hand side, we see the rewards of the state transitions if we take the action to cut. So this would be, we cut down a small forest, a medium forest, a large forest, or we are in the final state. And here we would have the rewards indicating with the waiting decision. We do not get anything from waiting, we do not get anything from waiting, and we get a small reward from the very excess, uh, excess of tree sizes, and no reward again for the terminal state. Likewise, our state transition probabilities would also now become action dependent. Here we would have the state transition probabilities to cut down the trees which is basically just this one vector, basically indicating that if in any situation we decide to cut the trees, we will have no forest anymore. And here, this weighting uh, matrix is basically the same probability matrix which we have seen all, uh, before, where these elements basically indicate the non-disaster probability, and this would indicate the disaster probability, and this one again here, this location would indicate, okay, if we are in the final state, we do not have the opportunity to go out of this final state anymore. Okay, therefore our problem has now become a little bit more complicated. The decisions which we can make inside our uh, MDP and our Markov decision processes are now represented by a policy. What a policy is, we have already introduced uh, briefly last week. I just want to repeat it here for formal reasons. So policy basically indicates that if we are in a state X, we have a certain probability to take action U. Right? So this will indicate if we are in a certain state, what we are going to do. So a very explicit formulation of where we are and what we do in a certain situation. And therefore, in MDPs, policies only depend on the current state, which is also sufficient because we have considered that the states are informative states and therefore do not depend on the past. And the policy also defines, of course, the agent's behavior, which might be stochastic, indicating here by this probability distribution, or which might be deterministic. So, if we then plug in an policy, so a certain probability of making, taking actions being in certain states with our state transition probabilities regarding certain actions, then what we basically get is a sequence of a Markov chain again, right? 
Because basically what we plug in together is certain probabilities of transitioning towards certain state with actions and a policy which is indicating what we do in certain states. And if we plug them together, we basically come back to an autonomous system because the probabilities of actions in policy pi together with the state transition probabilities, this is a closed kind of dynamics, right? So this is like control plant and controller. If you plug in control plant and the controller together and look on the system, on the closed loop system from the outside, this is an autonomous system where you can just observe what is happening, but basically everything is set. And if you do the same uh, for the rewards, then we basically have a Markov reward process because the reward probabilities giving certain actions over states are then also fully defined by this policy. Also, our state values, which we have indicated before, would now get smaller upgrades or updates. The state value of being in a certain state x is still, still the same definition as previously. No, the only thing which becomes important is that in an MDP, the state value will be subject to some policy pi indicating what we do in certain states. Right? So we have now opportunities to move through our MDP so we can make decisions. And depending on our decision policy, our values which we receive inside the MDP will be different. Right? So going back to our example, if you are like a tree hater and you cut down the trees in every point of time, then of course your state values which you will receive will be different from uh, a hippie which will basically do not cut down any trees and will stay with the tree forever. So therefore, the policy pi will indicate your state values. And if you change your policy, then the state value might change as well. And since now we also have actions, we can also indicate again our action value function, which we have uh, indicated last week already. So action value function, very similar to our state value, but it now has basically a second input variable, the action u. So basically, this will indicate how good it is to be in a certain state x, applying a certain action u, and then follows policy pi. Here, important it is to note that this action u can or cannot be in line with this policy pi. So this nomenclature basically means if we take any action u, we will then again, after this, follow some given policy pi, but this action u, which we will apply, can be from the same policy or from another policy or completely random or whatsoever. It just indicates if we are here and we are doing this move and then again follow a certain policy, that this will lead to a certain state action value. And if we have an MDP, we can again calculate the state action values are using the Bellman equation, or to be precise, the Bellman expectation equation, which will basically tell us if we have a certain policy pi given, uh, we can again use the Bellman expectation equation in this recursive form to calculate the state action value, which is the expectation of the reward plus the discounted state action value of the successor state. And giving our policy and the state action value, we can also rewrite this by basically something like a one-step look-ahead. So if we do a certain action following this policy pi, which will lead us towards a certain action u in some successor states, we can also represent the state action value via a combination of policy and state action values, which would be here again this uh, backup diagram. So we are here in the state, we follow a certain policy, or we follow a certain action and then follow a certain policy, leading to the state action values. Or, vice versa, from the state action point of view, we can also define uh, the Bellman expectation equation, here again in the recursive form, so the uh, state action value of state x and u is the same as instantaneous reward plus a discounted 
state action value of the successor state and the successor action. This can be then also represented by a one-step look-ahead search where we say, okay, this is the instantaneous reward plus the state value of the potential successor state following a certain action u. So therefore, these two variants are also just the Bellman expectation equation for our MDP in the state action value notation. If you then also insert these equations into each other, we again get in a some kind of yeah, vectorial kind of way, again, our recursive equations just in a different notions. This is just the same information as previously, where we can see that we have a recursive equation between v of xk and v of xk plus 1 and q of xk uk and q of xk plus 1 and uk plus 1. And these uh, equations, of course, will lead again to linear equations which we can utilize in order to calculate v pi xk and q pi xk uk for a given MDP. This would be again our equation for um, the Bellman expectation equation in matrix form. I feel that this equation in finite state and action spaces is much more easier to understand. So here, even in the MDP, this linear equation more or less looks very familiar with respect to the Markov reward processes. The only difference is now that all the values which we see here, the state value, the reward function, the state transition probability, and here again, the state values will now, of course, depend on our policy which we evaluate. But if you know these state transition probabilities for a certain policy, and if you know the reward functions for a certain policy, you know this vector, you know this matrix, gamma is given, and then again, you have n unknown equations, uh, n known equations with n unknown values, which you can basically solve for, for example, by a linear equation uh, solution by inverting this matrix identity minus pi uh, P and gamma. Okay. Let's do this a little bit more intuitively with our example again. Bowman expectation equation with a 50-50 policy. So what do I refer to by a 50-50 policy? For every state X, we assume a 50% probability to cut down the trees. And with another 50% probability for all states x, we assume to be waiting, right? So this would be a very simple policy, which is not state dependent, but basically tells us that for every state of the state space, we basically just flip a coin if we cut down the trees or if we wait until the next season. With this probability, we can now go, go into our representations uh, for the um, MDP of the forest. The rewards have been already fully formalized. The state transition probabilities are identical as before. If we cut down the trees, we will go to the forest state. And if we wait until the next season, there is this disaster probability. And since this is completely state independent, right, we can do this for all states, we can now basically blend in all the probabilities together, basically indicating that with our blended strategy, we get this pi x x dash over pi policy, which basically indicates the state transition probabilities that, for example, here, with probability 1 minus alpha half, so flipping our coin, and then seeing if we have a disaster or not, we will transit from state 1 to 2, or here with 1 plus alpha over 2, this would be basically our decision to cut down the tree. 
And here, the rewards are, of course, just the weighted sum of these two reward vectors. Right? So, therefore, what we see from this slide already, from this example is, here we have an MDP problem, so we have state transitions, rewards, and two decisions, right? So this would be here our problem space, where we have two actions, cutting and waiting. Here we have our, let's say, solution space, our policy, indicating what we do in a given situation. And if we plug them together, we again end up in a Markov reward process. Because in this Markov reward process, we just have our state transition probabilities and our reward probabilities. So problem space, solution space, MVP, policy, plugged together, ends up in an autonomous Markov reward process. This 50-50 policy with these discount factor and disaster probabilities, we can then again, I go to this slide, we can again solve this linear equation just by putting in the numbers into our solution here and solve for the unknown state values. If we do so in our first MDP, giving a 50-50 policy, we can see here v pi 1.1, v pi 1.9, v pi 2.9, and v pi here 0. So these would be the state values of this 50-50 policy. And this is very important that these state values only belong to our policy which we evaluate, right? So if we change our policy being something else than just a 50-50 chance of flipping a coin, to make a decision, then these state values, except of course of this, but these state values would basically change. We can then also co uh, calculate the state action values. The state action values can be calculated quite easily. How can we calculate that? Every state action value is basically the instantaneous reward plus the discounted state value of the state which we transit to. So for example here, the state value of, state action value of being one, is equal to this instantaneous we one of, of one, plus the state value of zero, here, this 1.22 is basically the instantaneous reward of zero, plus the discounted value of this state. So if you calculate this 1.9 with, what did we have? 0.8, you should end up at 1.22, and so on. So therefore, these state action values, which we have added here into the slide in red color font, are basically just the one-step predictions. So utilizing the instantaneous reward of a certain action, and the state action val uh, the, the value of the state we basically transit to. Okay. In these finite Markov decision processes with some exemplary policy, what we basically have evaluated so far is um, basically just evaluation and analysis in that sense. If we have a given that system, and if we have a given policy, if a policy is needed for an MDP, we can calculate the state action values and the state values basically indicating how good or bad it is to be in a certain state doing a certain action. However, what we have not discussed yet is actually how to get towards optimal policies, right? So we just have analyzed the problem dynamics we have come up with metrics indicating certain usefulnesses of certain states and certain state actions, but we did not discuss yet how we can actually try to improve our policy in such a way 
that these state action values and state values become maximal, become optimal, right? And this will be the outlook basically of our last subsection. But I would recommend that we maybe make a five, maybe a good five to ten minutes break before we move on with this one, because this will take maybe another, I would guess, 25 minutes or something like that. And then we will have a little break here and then we will continue in. 15.25. Okay? Okay, guys. So, let's try to quickly finish this. Um, it's basically just an, an, I would call it an outlook in that sense that we will also discuss the solution methods throughout the entire course series uh, with the optimal policies, but it's basically already to give you some notion of what we define as optimal and to give you some brief idea of how we can basically find optimal policies in a, let's say, brute force way. So in a very uh, simple, in a very uh, brutal kind of way, and then based on that, we're going to introduce more elegant solution method next week. So first of all, what is an optimal policy or what is an optimal policy in general leading to an optimal state value function. And this is basically quite trivial from a very general point of view. We consider an optimal policy and therefore an optimal state value as such a policy which will be able to maximize the state value, right? So if I have some problem defined by an MDP, I want to find a policy which will allow us to give us optimal decisions such that the state value becomes maximal. Yes, there's a question. Aha, good question. It is both. <laughs> so, um, if we have optimal state values, we will also have optimal state action values. We can basically try to find optimal policies from both viewpoints. So these two definitions here are basically leading to the same outcome, so to the same solution. We just take a different viewpoint. Here with the state action values, we would basically have a very direct viewpoint in that sense that the state action value is defined for a state action pair. So if we are in a certain state, and we have a finite number of decisions. We can just compare the different decisions which we have at hand and decide for the action which leads to the maximum state action value. So this would be like a direct kind of solution. And here was the state value. As this is defined for the states, we would add up a certain prediction step basically looking at the different actions and seeing where we will basically transit to with the one step ahead prediction and then from there on basically calculate effectively the state action value as well. So therefore just two different viewpoints, same solution as we will see later on and um, same idea, we want to find policies maximizing the value either from the viewpoint just of state values or state action values. Um, yes, so optimal value function therefore denotes the best possible agent's performance for a given MDP. And most importantly, if we are operating in an infinite MDP, where we have a finite number of states and a finite number of actions u, if somebody, a ferry, would give you this function, which we abbreviate here with q star, so the star notation is like for optimal, or V star, then our MDP problem, our decision-making problem, which reinforcement learning is all about, is done, right? So if somebody gives you Q star, or analogously V star, you do not need to do something, you are done. Because if you have this function, either magically given to you by somebody, or pragmatically calculated with one of the many solution methods which we will get to know throughout the course series, 
your problem is solved. Because if you have Q star, the optimal state action values, if you're in a certain state and you have a finite number of actions, you just compare the Q star values for all the actions and just take the action which is having the highest state action value. Right? That's it. Because in Q, using the Bellman equation, which has this recursive kind of fashion, which will basically map all entire potential rewards, discounted rewards in the future towards your current decision problem state. This is all the, the, the entire metric which we need in order to make an optimal decision. Because this is basically incorporating all future rewards which we will potentially get from being in a state X and applying an action U. So therefore we will see that especially in the context of finite MDPs, that obtaining this state action value is the key towards solution. Later on in continuous state in action spaces, the picture will change a little bit. But in finite MDPs, this is our goal, so to speak, to get the state action value function, because if we have that, we are done. Okay? So therefore, we can also formally define what we consider an optimal policy, and therefore we can define a partial ordering of policies. So what we define by ordering means that a policy pi is greater or equal to a policy pi dash if the state value of this policy for all states in the state space is better or identical to the policy of p dash. Right? And important here for all states of the state space. So if there's one state from the state space where this greater or equal relation does not hold, it would be not a better or equal policy. Therefore, one can show, and we will just do this very briefly on the next slide, that in finite MDPs, so this is important here, finite MDPs, there always exists an optimal policy, which we will call then also pi star, star again here is an abbreviation for optimality, which is better or equal than all other policies. And this policy will lead to the optimal state action, state action value and also state value. And potentially, as this is greater or equal, it will also mean that there might be not a single policy which is optimal, but potentially also a set of policies which are an optimal set of policies leading to the same state action values for all states and all actions. But the important part here of the theorem, we will briefly um, prove the theorem on the next slide or on the next lecture, uh, we will see. But this will basically indicate that in finite MDPs, because we have a finite problem space, we will be always able to find an optimal solution. We will see different ways how to get this optimal solution, but as long as our problem space is finite, we will be able to get an optimal solution. That's a nice thing for finite MDPs, that they are always solvable in that sense. And in order to solve this, uh, or in order to find uh, optimal state action values, what we are going to utilize today and more intensively even next week is the Bellman principle of optimality or the Bellman optimality equation. Bellman, he was an uh, American mathematician, uh, most famous for his work on optimality in the context of different uh, decision making problems. And he basically suggested in the 60s the Bellman principle of optimality, which says that an optimal policy has a property that whatever the initial state and the initial decision are, the remaining decisions must constitute an optimal policy with regard to the state resulting from the first decision. So that basically means that, let's say I want to travel a certain path, for example, I want to travel from here to the exit of the, of the lecture room, and I know that from this problem, a certain 
intermediate location is definitely part of the optimal solution. So if I'm here, I know that I have come closer to my goal to, to leave this room, that if I find a policy which will basically minimize my travel time from my initial state to this intermediate state from which I know that this is optimal, that also this policy derived from the initial state will also be an optimal one. So we are therefore able, using the Bellman principality of optimality, to chunk our optimal policy into different pieces as they recursively need to be self-sufficient. So therefore, any policy must satisfy the self-consistency condition given the Bellman expectation equation, and an optimal policy must deliver the maximum expected return being in a given state. So we can therefore also derive this basically uh, very equally than the Bellman expectation equation, and now the Bellman optimality equation is similar, but here, in that regard, that we want to solve for an optimal state value, and therefore for optimal decisions, we insert here in contrast to the Bellman expectation equation, now in the Bellman optimality equation, this max operator basically telling us that the optimal state value being in some certain state x is identical to the best action I can take in this state with respect to the state action value. So this would be this one step look ahead, which I've already mentioned, that if we only have knowledge of the state values, we would basically just need to make a one step look ahead and find the optimal action here with respect to the right-hand side. The state action value can then be, of course, rewritten by its formal definition, expectation of the returns being the state x, applying an action u. That can be then rewritten again by the recursive equation. And of course, the return of a certain state can be also represented by the state value of the successor state, which will basically give us this recursive Bellman optimality equation with respect to the state values, and as I've mentioned already here, with respect to the Bellman optimality equation, we have to utilize this max operator here, which was not there in the Bellman expectation equation. Right? So we have two different Bellman equations. Bellman expectation equation basing giving us information about states and state values if the policy is already there, and the Bellman optimality equation, which will give us information about the state values and state action values if you're searching for an optimal policy. So there, sometimes there is a danger of confusion because in short, we would call both Bellman equation, but the one is the Bellman expectation equation, and the other one, as we can see here, would be the Bellman optimality equation, which will give us information about optimal policy. The uh, Bellman optimality equation here also in this context of this backup diagram as a visual representation of it is also similar. The only thing what we can now see is this, yeah, what is it? This uh, quarter of a circle here, basically, which is indicating the max operator. So this basically means that from all potential actions which could follow from this current state here, we are looking for the action which will basically lead to the maximum state value following certain policies after the another. In the alternative representation here again, with the state transition probabilities, we can rewrite this equation also in finite MDP, cases here in this vectorial kind of representation as seen previously. Only difference again is here that we have this max operator indicating that we are trying to search for an optimal policy. Likewise, we can of course also do the same for the state action values with the Bellman optimality equation. So where Q star, so our optimal policy uh, state action value must be self-sufficient in that sense, that it's a recursive equation with respect to the maximum state action value which we can get for searching for an optimal action here. 
So this would be then the Bellman optimality equation where the big difference is only this max operator basically indicating that we are searching for the best possible decision. In a finite MDP, this can be then again written in this factorial representation. And if we draw a backup diagram as a graphical representation of the um, Bellman optimality equation for the state action values, the only difference again is here that if we are in a certain state, we will search for the best possible action such that we can maximize our state action value. Okay, so basically very identical to what we had previously, but just with the extension that we are searching for optimal actions now. Okay, so how can we solve this, right? So this is just basically our idea, the Bellman optimality equation, that the policy which should be optimal needs to be self-sufficient with respect to this equation or the state value equation which we have seen previously. However, of course, we need again to solve here for the state values or the state action values in this optimal sense, which will mean that if we have um, the state value equation, that we will have again n unknowns and n state value equations, or if we have the state action values with m number of actions, then we would have n times n unknowns and n times n action value equations, which we then basically need to solve for. We will do this solving today brute forcely, basically, and we will add up more elegant methods later on during the next lecture. So therefore, if the environment or problem definition is exactly known, solving for V star and Q star basically directly delivers us an optimal policy. If we have Q star, we can basically, as said, just directly look for the best possible action. If we have V star, we basically have to make a one step a look ahead prediction to get Q. And therefore, even though this decision basis is very short-sighted, because we basically just for the next possible action, as discussed, Q and V already save all information about the future rewards in the current decision, such that even this is basically an instantaneous or one step ahead prediction kind of decision, we do not need to make up our uh, mind about future problems here, because everything is condensed in this information. Okay, so very theoretic. Um, takeaway message is basically this Bellman optimality equation for state action values and Bellman optimality equation for state value equations, basically indicating that if you have certain policies and certain decisions which you want to evaluate for optimality, they need to to be self-sufficient, so if you plug in these state values or state action values as seen on the other equation, they need to fulfill these equations, and if they do not fulfill these equations, so if you can find actions which will lead to better state values or state action values, you already know that this policy which you are currently evaluating cannot be the optimal one. So we can therefore also indicate this Bellman optimality equations as some optimal condition equations basically telling us if a policy fulfills these equations, they are optimal, and if a policy does not fulfill these equations, then the policy cannot be optimal. Okay. Let's give a little example to that to make it more clear. So here again, we have our um, policy finding problem for the forest tree MDP. So that means for every of these three states where we can make distinct decisions, right, this fourth state is not important because here we cannot make a decision, but for these three states, the question is, what is the optimal decision in each state to maximize our values, right? So this is now the question we want to answer. And we will make use of the Bellman optimality equation to do so. So the question is now, in expectation, should I wait or cut in state number one? In expectation, should I wait or cut in state number two? And what is about state number three? Should I wait or cut in the state? So we need to find now, and we will find some solutions to this answer. 
So, therefore, what we now basically just do is we will take the Bellman optimality equation and we'll apply it to this problem, which we have graphically denoted here. And in order to make this, let's say, a little bit more um, intuitive and in a an, in an ele more elegant way, we will basically write down our problem in inverse order. So we will start with writing down the Bellman optimality equation first for the last state, then for the second last state, and so on. Because in this special case, our last state is a terminal state, so after this there will be no further states in the last state, and in this sense, starting from this last state, the terminal state will be easier due to the specific structure of our problem. So, using the Bellman optimality equation, starting in our last state, the value of this last state is obviously trivial because it will be zero. We do not get any reward, we do not have any further reward expectations, so full stop here. The optimal state value for state number three now becomes a little bit more interesting. So here this max operator comes from the Bellman optimality equation. And these two lines of this bracket here are basically our two options. The second line here is basically our cut option. We get a direct instantaneous reward of three due to cutting down the forest, plus the discounted value of the successor state. Right? This successor state is zero value, as we have seen here, so we can plug this in here. So we know that the second line for V star in the third state is three. And here in this first line, this would be the waiting option, right? So we get an instantaneous reward of one in the last state, plus the discounted state action value of the successor state. And of course, this successor state is only reached with probability one minus alpha times V star of three, right? So this would be our second equation. Next equation pair would be the state value for the second state, so for our medium-sized trees. Again, this lane will be for the cutting option, so we get an instantaneous reward of two for cutting, plus the value of the gone state, which for obvious reason is zero, so here it would stay just two. And the first line of this bracket term is basically the instantaneous reward of one, plus the discounted value of the successor state, which is here basically the unknown, yet unknown, successor state value, V star uh, X3. And so on, we can do the same for the initial state, with here the cutting option, and here the waiting option. Right? So now we have a very nice equation system with this max operator. What we can do now, is basically twofold. The very bazooka-like solution method would be, this is an optimization problem with unknowns V star for x1, x2, x3, which is defined as some kind of optimization problem, right? So you can put this optimization problem into a numerical optimization solver and ask, dear solver, this is my problem, please solve for these values, for example, by some gradient descent method or whatsoever. But this is not necessary in this case, because, ah, from last week, very good. Let's have a view on this equation. So here, this value is already set, and what is standing here is 1 plus gamma, 1 minus alpha, times V star for x equals 3. But this is also there on the left-hand side, right? So we have V star from x equals 3 is equal 1 plus gamma, 1 minus alpha times v star x equals 3. 
So this is a very nice linear equation, and we can basically solve directly for V star, which would be then uh, 1 divided 1 minus gamma times 1 minus alpha, right? So we can oops, flex this in here, and then just for a problem, definition with some gamma and with some alpha, this will be some value, and then we can just make a binary decision, either this value of this first line is greater, or the 3 is greater, and then this basically means we will do weighting or cutting. And when we have decided what here is optimal, we can go to the next decision, because we need restore here as a successor state, plug it in, and again make a decision here, what has a greater value. And then again here, right? So due to this finite set problem, because we have a finite set problem and we have this Bellman optimality equation which allows us for recursively solving this problem, we do not even need some kind of, in, at least in the simple problem, some kind of optimization solver because we can just do it on the blackboard here. Okay? If you do so for gamma 0.8 and alpha 0.2, this will be the state values, the optimal state values, which you will get. And basically, for every state, you can then make decisions of what is being optimal. So for example, let's do it from this state. So if you're in the state x2, what you can basically do is, you can uh, compare the reward of plus 2 plus the discounted state value of the successor state, which will make the state action value being 2 for this branch. And for this branch, it would be an instantaneous reward of 0 plus the state action value of 3 of the successor state with probability 1 minus alpha, which would be the state action value for this branch, and then you can basically compare which action is optimal, right? So here you need to make this one-step prediction in order to decide what would be the optimal actions. Of course, these values, state values, would also change. What we have now done here is we have increased the discount factor from 0.8 to 0.9. So we can therefore see that the state values increase and this might also potentially lead to different actions. If you do not want to do this one-step look-ahead search, you can also directly calculate the optimal state action values, the Q stars, by just setting up a similar but little bit extended equation system. Also, here with our notation, x1 for the first state and uc being cutting. So here we would get an instantaneous reward of 1. Here for the weighting, we would get no instantaneous reward, but just the state action value of the successor state action value. Here in the second state, the identical one, this would be the cutting problem. This would be the weighting path. Here for the third state, again, our cutting option and our waiting path, and so on. If you look now at this equation system, we have six equations. However, three of them are already determined, right? So this equation is determined, this is determined, and this is determined. So basically, we have like three free equations with three unknowns, which are the state action values. But if you look at this last state, this is again Q star of X3 U weighting, which is the same as on this equation. So, so again, you can basically solve this manually, solve for Q star in this state, and then use it here and use it there, right? So again, you can solve this manually just by linear rearranging and binary decision. So here, this is again formally written down in a more formal sense. And as I said, you can solve this, put it there, 
you can solve this, put it there, and then you have solved it in the same identical way as with the state values. The good thing is, if you do this, you get then the state action values for all actions in this problem, and this will then basically give you the instantaneous information about what you should do. Right? So here in the small prob in the small state, you would compare these two state action values. Here the cutting state action value is smaller, so we would wait. Here, the decision changes. We would get a smaller state action value for waiting than for cutting. So in this case, the optimal decision would be to cut down everything. And if for whatever reason, you would start in the large tree situation, so you buy a large forest from somebody or whatsoever, you would also see that here the waiting state action value is smaller than the cutting state action value. So again, optimal decision would here to be to cut. So here it would be waiting, cutting, cutting, which we just can find out by comparing these state action values. If again, so if we change here the discount factor, basically just changing our environment, changing our problem, we would see that our long-term rewards would be more appreciated now. And what this will basically lead to is that these state action values here on this upper weighting branch are increasing. And therefore, in this changed environment, in this changed problem, we would now see that in all three states, the optimal decision would be to wait. Because now, this state action value, this state action value, and this state action value is greater than the alternative state action values of, uh, of cutting, right? So, what is really the, the, the key takeaway message from this for you is that we need to find solutions how to calculate these state action values. Now we have done this with a model, right? So we have assumed that we know all the model dynamics, we have all the information of the MDP in order to calculate these Q values. And once you have these Q values, you are done. Um, however, we have done this basically by, manual, by a manual solution, writing down these equations here, solve them manually, find the solutions, which is fine, which is okay. But of course, um, if you consider, for example, a problem, like a backgammon, so a board game, or chess is another board game, which has uh, many, many states, and also many, many actions in these states. That's not really like nice to write down an equation system for 10 to the power of 20 states and actions, right? So therefore, what we basically need to do is we need to find methods which can also work for large-scale problems. Also, as I've mentioned, we need full information about the MDP, about our model dynamics, which might be also not given every time that we have full model knowledge. And therefore, the reinforcement learning problem or motivation behind this is that we want to find solutions which can find approximate solutions, so solutions which are maybe not formally optimal, so what we have, decide, what we have derived they are formally optimal solutions, but maybe also solutions which are near optimal, but which can scale to large problems. And we want to combine these with solutions which do not need full knowledge about the problem which we're interacting with, because uh, in very complex problems, so for example, one of the, the examples which you had last week, where, the, where this nuclear fusion reactor kind of control, where having a 100% precise model of a nuclear fusion reactor might be not available. But in that sense, we want to have information or solutions which can also work on problems where we do not have any a priori model knowledge or very limited a priori model knowledge. And reinforcement learning solutions will, will basically address these two domains, right? Because, just to make this very clear, all subsequent lectures will just redo this. So we will do nothing else, just do this. It's all about finding these values in these branches and inside the bubbles, 
because they indicate our optimal solutions and our optimal values of these solutions. And we will just try to get these numbers and therefore the optimal decisions in different ways. But that's really everything which you need to know about reinforcement learning. And therefore, it's also super important to know the interpretation of these numbers because they will be our metrics which we use throughout the entire lecture. Okay. There's a summary. This is more or less for you uh, for home reading. We do not need to go through this again today. I think you get the big points from MDP. We have seen MDPs as a problem scope. So MDPs are basically our plants, our environments, which we utilize in order to frame our problems. And we have seen a brute force manual kind of solution methods with writing down the Bellman optimality equations as a set of linear equations which we can solve manually in order to find optimal decisions. And we're going to automate these kind of solutions in a more intelligent fashion in the subsequent lecture. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Okay, so the question is about sampling here, basically. So here in these solutions, we basically have not utilized samples, right? So here, we have worked with the state transition probabilities. So if you, for example, look at these parentheses here, this is basically indicating that if we decide to wait in state number two, if we decide to wait in state number two, we will have a transition probability of 1 minus alpha to make it to the third state. So what we have used here are not the exemplary samples of the random process behind, but we have directly used the transition probabilities, right? So therefore, this, is, this solution which we have derived here is already taking into account the stochastic nature of the problem. And we do not need to take into account samples, but which would be just, you know, uh, approximations um, of the random process. Okay. So here, uh, maybe let's go through the Bellman optimality equation. Yes. So for example, here, if you look at this, we sum up about the state transition probability space. So the Bellman optimality equation, as well as the Bellman expectation equation, which we have seen previously, they are based not on samples, but on the stochastic transition probabilities and on the stochastic reward probabilities, right? So utilizing the probability would be the, the one way to model it, which we have utilized here, and using samples as random uh, realizations of the stochastic process would be another kind of problem or another kind of approach which we will actually utilize for many of the data-driven reinforcement learning techniques. So this will actually come later, utilize samples in order to solve it, but here we have used the stochastic nature of the problem itself. 